Of the Motor Photographic Society, and um, today I would like to start this session with a minute of silence for the demise of Mario Kutaya's mother. Thank you. Another Thursday and another meetup. I am proud to present two prolific underwater photographers, Arkadiusz Strebnik, a Polish who resides in Malta, and John Borch, he is from Sliema. The society tries to approach various accomplished local and international photographers who are well informed in the photographic niche they practice. Underwater photography is becoming more popular not only among divers, but also with swimmers. Many of those who have the idea that underwater photography is usually done while scuba diving, in fact, it can be practiced while diving on surface supply, snorkeling and swimming. Underwater photography is also categorized as an art form and a method for recording data of the world down there. Successful underwater imaging, like the ones that both photographers today are going to display, offers exciting and rare photographic opportunities. During today's presentations, Arcadius and John are going to give us a taste of the equipment used to photograph the scenes beneath sea level, the preparation behind a shoot, lighting equipment, composition, basic problems and other challenges of underwater photography. During our pre webinar meeting, I got to know that four years ago, Arcadius enrolled as a member of our long-standing society for one year. He still has the membership card. He is also involved in Dunk's 
photo society in Poland. I am very pleased to say that the group is made, sorry, um, this Tuesday, I have met the students who registered for the beginner's course in photography. I am very pleased to say that the group is made up of young and mature students, local and foreigners who are keen to learn photography. I invited these students to join the Thursday weekly meetings. And I am sure that today there are some who joined to follow us. I know that Steve enough who is interested in underwater photography is here with us. It is very important to welcome and greet new members and make them feel part of this large family who has a common interest, photography. May I kindly remind you to renew your membership. Without your loyalty and support, the executive committee would not be able to continuously provide our members with valuable benefits and actively develop our photographic community. Your financial help counts a lot. And now let me share with you a PowerPoint presentation with the latest news from the photographic community. And afterwards, I hand the floor to our dear friends, John and Arcadius. Thanks. Now the floor is yours, Arcadio Sancho. I will open your mics. Okay. Okay. Fine. Can you hear me? Yep. Good evening, everyone. So what we will try to do today is um, give you a, like a bigger um, view on uh, underwater photography. Uh, we'll try not to go like super deep into details because um, underwater photography is a, such a huge topic that we will not have any time. We'll have to meet every week to do that. Uh, but we've got a lot of equipment to show and a lot of um, photos to show you. So the presentation is a bit brief, but then um, if you've got any questions, please, please type them in the, in the chat. And after we finish the presentation, uh, what we would like to do is we will, I will put a slideshow so you can actually see our photos and what are we doing and uh, we can answer all of your questions. Okay. So let me start the presentation. Uh, 
can you please let me share the screen because it says that it's not working. Um, you, you can, Arka, just, just um, uh, down, bottom line. Yes, but it's showing me that host disabled. Part okay, disabled. sorry. So let me try again. Okay. Now it's working. Okay. So can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, let's go. So a bit uh, brief about history of underwater uh, photography, because um, some of these things is really interesting. What's interesting is that the first photo that was taken underwater was taken like briefly 20 years after photography was uh, invented. Uh, which is actually like super interesting thing because people already started to go underwater and started to take these huge cameras and build something to put them underwater to see what's inside. Um, this photo that you're seeing now, a uh, photo of, I don't know what, uh, it's not the actual first photo, it was made later, but that's what they could do at the time, but they still actually did it. So. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. And um, 1893 to uh, 1900s, Louis Bhutan was doing a series of underwater photographs and published them in a book. And that was the first person who actually invented how to get the light down there and how to do uh, a real photo. So you can see like the photo on the right side of the screen is, is his actual photo and down uh, on the bottom, you can see him uh, with his camera in the metal box that he actually took underwater. And on the left side, you can see uh, the invention of the light that he was using to make his photography. Uh, 1914, Ernst William, uh, Williamson and his brother George shot the first uh, underwater motion movie. Uh, as, we do, as we're talking about underwater photography, uh, it is really connected, especially nowadays, with uh, videos that people are doing. Um, the equipment is giving us uh, always both. So uh, the first video was made already in 1914. In uh, 1927, uh, first underwater color pictures made for National Geographic. And you can see them on the right corner on the top. Uh, 1950, first commercial camera housing in France was made. The commercial means that you could actually like buy it. They did produce, it was uh, massively produced, uh, made especially for uh, Foca camera and everybody could buy it. Because uh, before everything that they did was a custom made and everybody um, did their own housings in, in home and tried to put that in some metal boxes. Uh, 1956, uh, amazing film by Jacques Cousteau, uh, A Silent World. The film is well known. I'm quite sure everybody's seen it, or if not, you have to, you have to do it. Uh, it's won so many, uh, so many prizes, um, and it's it's a breakthrough uh, with the color movies. Uh, 1960, 1963, uh, first underwater camera camera calypso photo. Uh, that was then rebranded by Nikonos. It was actually a camera that was made by Jacques Cousteau and his friends uh, for them to use. And that was a camera that didn't need a housing. Uh, the Nikonos camera, if you go to eBay and you want to check, uh, of course, it's a, it's a film camera. Uh, they still have amazingly high prices and it's still amazing, amazing uh, piece of equipment that you can buy. A lot of them are in good conditions and, and um, you can actually do uh, pictures with them. 1970, uh, David Dobilet sets most of the rules that we use today in um, underwater photography. Um, it was a person who was doing a lot of photographs and, and he, he did the basics for everybody to use now. Uh, 1985, first photo of Titanic, why it's so important? Because it's super deep. <laughs> And um, the Titanic, the, everybody could see how the Titanic looks like. 
1994, there was a first 3D movie made underwater. Uh, so the um, equipment that they used is completely, completely um, up to date and completely different now. And 2004 is the first GoPro camera invented. Uh, I know that's not a huge thing, but it's a huge thing to, uh, that has meaning to what I will say, because for most of my underwater photography, I actually use only a GoPro camera. Okay, so what are the problems in underwater photography? Uh, of course, if you want to be a diver um, and do a photography deeper uh, under the water, you're fully loaded with equipment, which means that uh, you have to take care about yourself and try to not die underwater, let's say like that. And uh, except that you have, to, you have to do a photo and take care about the equipment, take care about the expo exposition, and all the other stuff. So um, there, is, there is a lot of things to think. And the basic thing is a visibility. Oh, I can't, what is going on? Now, what is visibility? Visibility is how clear the water is. Um, the problem is that in a different uh, seas, in a different areas, um, the water can, um, can have parts that are floating inside that are ruining the visibility. Even you can see that when you go into um, to the seashore after, after some kind of storms and things, the, the, the water is not that transparent. So uh, it's a huge problem for in photography and it's something that you can't really affect. Uh, um, but the bad visibility will affect uh, how much light we will have underwater and uh, the sharpness of image. There will be a problem with focusing of the camera and all, all the other stuff is, can be ruined by the visibility that you will have. That's like two photos. One is made, the, the left one is made on uh, the deepest pool in Europe. That's actually in Poland. And you can see that it's made um, below 30 meters and the, um, the water in there is cl crystal clear so you can see all the way up uh, even above the, um, the water level so that's like a perfect visibility and the second photo on your right is actually made in Malta this is uh, a submarine uh, stubborn that's on 55 meters I believe on the bottom and Malta is a place that actually have a really good visibility. Most of the time when you, when you go for a diving, when you go to take pictures, you will find that the visibility is, is really good. So it's way easier to take photographs underwater. Now, the second problem is light itself. As everybody knows, what we need uh, to take the pictures is the light. And the light is the basic a basic thing, it has to bounce off from the object and come back to us, uh, to the camera, um, so we can, so the sensor can see it. And the problems with light underwater is that it has to go through different, um, different areas from, from air to water, then again through glass, uh, to um, again air and then it's going to our camera so it's changing um, a lot of times and as you can see in here um, when the sunlight is going on the water a lot of the light is basically reflected from the surface on, of the water so not all of the light that we have outside is going down under the water. The second thing is that, um, as you can see, it's changing the direction that it's going. And that is when we have a perfect condition, when the water is completely still, when we have some kind of waves, the water, like everybody seen the dancing light on the bottom of the water. Um, and uh, that's, that's actually the effect of, of light that is bending on the surface of the water. 
Uh, the best time, like what we want to avoid is the light uh, when it's dusk and or when it's when it's a sunrise, because um, then the, the angle that the light is going through the water um, is doing um, is, is making more of the light to bounce off of the surface of the water. So everybody is saying that the best time to photograph underwater is between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So when the light, uh, when the sun is the highest. The, <laughs> we've got another thing with the light going through. So there is a diffusion in the water. There is a absorption of the water itself that is absorbing the light. And there is a scattering of the water by particles that are already in the water. It all means that we're losing a lot, a lot of air when we're going down. When we want to go to 10 meters, we will actually have around 50% less of the, um, uh, the light that we have outside, which means that it's way, way dark, darker. The deeper we go, the less light we will have. The thing is, it works not only when the light is going down, as I said, when you, uh, to make the picture, the light has to bounce off from what we want to uh, photograph. And the distance between the camera and the object that you're taking a picture is, um, is having the same rules when the, uh, as the light that's going down. So when you go and photograph um, 10 meters deep and you will be 10 meters away from the object that you're photographing is actually like you were photographing directly closest to the object as possible on 20 meters. Yeah, you will have that loss of light. So um, you will see that most of the pictures that everybody is doing is, um, is done with um, uh, wide angle lenses. And that is just because you want to be as close to the object as possible to not lose the light. So it is very, very important. And it is really hard to do a really wide angle, um, like when you have a huge wreck, to go fur further enough to, to catch the whole wreck. Yeah, because you have to have like super wide angle um, lens. Uh, just because of that, if you go too, too far, the, the distance between you and the, and the wreck will make it completely blurred and maybe you will see the wreck, but not, not sharp, not, there will be nothing to see. Next thing is the color. When the light is going uh, deeper, we're losing completely the colors. So the first, uh, the first um, color of the light that we're losing is red and actually like five meters below the surface, we will not see the red color. Uh, then it's orange, yellow, green, and the last one that will stay is only blue. Um, of course, the um, like fishes and everything that we can find underwater, that doesn't mean that when you do a picture, they don't have the color. It's just that the, the, the colorful light is not reflecting from it. When we add artificial light, is it a video light or a strobe, you will see that the colors are in there. Um, that's an example. That's the same wreck. Um, again, the, the submarine, 55 meters. So basically, whatever we will have will completely not have any red light, nothing. And um, the photo on the right side is actually more or less without any light. You can see a bit up front that it's a bit yellowish. That's uh, a video light that bounces a bit. Um, and you can see the diver have a torch with yellow light, and it's actually not a yellow torch with yellow light. It's just, uh, it just looks like that. And then on the left side, on the bottom, you can see the same wreck, but it's with a video light directly on it, really close, and it took out all the colors that are actually in there. That's why it's super important to take your own light with you when you're going deeper. When, you, uh, when you're shooting at, um, like, let's say up to five meters, there will be no problem with, with um, the camera registering the colors. But when you go deeper, you will not have these red colors 
uh, the only thing that you will have is this blue or greenish um, type of color registered. Next thing is something that is a problem everywhere, so white balance. Um, now, color of the water will change depending on the surroundings. So even in Malta, what is, what is actually super funny, in Chircoa, we've got two wrecks, P29 and Rosie, and um, they are both on, um, on a sand, but one is closer to the reef, and the reef is, uh, is changing completely um, the color balance. When you do the pictures of both of the wrecks at the same settings, you will have one that is completely greenish and the, the second that will be completely blue. So even in the same place, uh, the white balance will change. Of course, it will change when you go deeper, when you go shallower and, and every, every time. That's why the most common practice to set up your white balance, uh, balance is taking um, the white board with you. You can see a lot of divers uh, with cameras having a white board with them. And of course, setting the white balance on the, um, on the spot before taking the pictures to get as close as possible. And as we, um, we have the technology and Photoshop, and uh, I hope everybody is shooting their pictures with the uh, you can you can change a lot in post-production. And uh, even if the white balance is not perfect, if you want it to be perfect, you can, you can do a lot in a post-production. Okay, so that was the most basic problems that we have. Of course, there will be a way more when we dig into the equipment, into other stuff, but that's later. Now, the basic equipment to take pictures underwater. Of course, we have to have a camera, some, some kind of camera. <coughs> Most of the time it has to be in a housing. So protective thing that will keep it dry from, from the water. Um, we have to have some kind of lights that will take down there. Is the strobe or a video light that doesn't matter? Well, it does matter, but it's your choice. Um, there's a lot of additional stuff like rig ports, additional like small equipment that you use. And of course, you can have different types of light modifiers. So what kind of cameras? Um, there is compact waterproof cameras, like the, the, the uh, yellow Nikon that you see uh, on the top right. And that is actually one of the cameras that I use for my macro shots. It's really simple. It's made to be without the housing and it can go down to 30 meters. So it's like a very useful camera. Uh, not the best, but actually very, very useful if you want to do a macro. Um, you can have a compact with housings and compact with housings like, like this one. You can see in here, that's compact made by a company Sea Life. They are making only underwater um, uh, equipment, uh, only underwater cameras. And it comes with a housing like that. Has all the buttons. So you can, you can go through the whole menu and every setting that you want underwater. And it's like a basic set um, with a compact camera. Uh, then we can have a bigger camera. So DSLRs, like the, um, exactly like the ones that you use. And um, the thing is that when you have one kind of camera, one type of camera, so is it Nikon like, or Canon maybe, I don't know. Uh, let's go with Canon 7D. Uh, you have to have F after um, a housing for it. Uh, you can have a mirrorless cameras, which is getting like super popular right now. And it's mm, most of the time because they are really small and the housing <laughs> is really way smaller for them. Uh, you can have action cameras. So like the GoPro camera, that I was talking at the beginning, which is like super small and uh, it is really um, nice to have it on your dives or wherever you go in the water. And of course, there's still analog cameras that you can buy. Like you can see here, the, the blue one, that's a one time um, underwater analog camera that you just take out the film and you destroy the camera and throw it away. 
but of course you can buy something like that it's still on the market uh, so it's like a compact camera compact analog camera that you can um, exchange the films the camera is inside of course it has it has completely nothing uh, it has a flash inside yeah and one lens and you have to point like that to, to, to know what you're shooting. It has a small one in here, but like with the mask and everything is completely not visible, but I did a photo with it and, and it's, it's pretty cool to use that kind of stuff. The housing is going like with this one up to 10 meters without any problem. So it's a cool stuff if somebody wants to, wants to play and check what will go out. Now with the housings, the housings are made most of the time to a certain type of camera that you have. The one that, uh, the, the bug that you see on the left top side is something that my friends used. I never used it. Uh, I was always scared about my camera, uh, but apparently they are not that bad. Of course, nobody will take it super deep, but when you go and swim with it, uh, um, it's actually uh, not the worst uh, decision and it's super cheap to buy. Um, and I know that a lot of kayakers and people who just want to do um, deal with water on the boats, they are using that kind of stuff. Um, of course, um, the GoPro cameras, the action cameras, uh, like from GoPro 8 up to 10, they are, they are um, protected from water, but it's maximum to 10 meters. So when you want to go deeper, you have to have an additional um, additional um, housing for it. Now, when it comes to proper housings, I will show you like the housings can be made um, from different materials. Like this one that is in here, of course, it's like one of the smallest, uh, but it's still really big. It's made from plastic. Uh, of course, it's like the, the good uh, type of plastic, really strong. It's uh, rated down to 60 meters. It has all the buttons, which is pretty important when you will choose the, the housing because most of the, the cheaper it gets, the less buttons you will get. So you will not have these options to change anything underwater at some point. Um, and that's basically a thing that you put the camera inside just to make it dry. Looks like that. It should be a perfect fit for a certain type of camera. This one is for um, uh, Canon 80D. Uh, so the entry level uh, camera, um, just like that. And it's made out of plastic and you can have a housings that are made from metal. So this is very good brand, German one and it's rated actually to 100 meters. Uh, it's made from aluminum. It has, of course, all the buttons, but this one is made for analog camera, for, for Nikon D80. Uh, so it's like the older stuff. Uh, yes, the problem is that the housings are always twice as much than the camera. So it's easier to buy the housing that uh, to the camera that you have than buy the camera and the housing. Like John, how much how much did you pay for your housing? Well, I'm using the Nikon D750 you know, and my housing would be about, I don't know, the housing is about 2000, 2200. And that's on the lower end of the of the prices. Yeah. You, you can go up to four and five and six thousand as well on the same thing. It can do that. It can basically do the same thing, but obviously a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> so the housing is protect. much more expensive than the camera. Yes, exactly. yes. At least twice as much as the camera with the lens. The camera, the camera is about, the Nikon on its own is about, what is it? 1,200, 1,300. If you have the lens, I use the, the 14 to 24, you know, wide angle, like Arik was saying. That's another 1,600, 1,700. The costs go up in the underwater photography, but you build it slowly, slowly. I mean, I built it over years, you know, I had, the, I was before underwater photography, I was doing on land. So I kind of built up all my lenses, built up all my cameras. 
And then I went for the more expensive, who went for the housing and the lighting. The, yes, of course, if you want to go deeper, you have to have a better one and better one costs more money. So it's like never ending loop that you have to go into. Uh, but as, you, as a photographer, as you probably already know that loop. Mm -hmm. When you buy a camera, there's always something more to buy. And then you're changing the camera and you have to buy it all again. Um, so yes, that's, that's, that's what we have to deal with in uh, underwater, but the prices are just just crazy. But then there are other options, Arek. Um, there, are, there, there are some um, underwater housing that you can um, adapt. It's called Easy Dive. There's a, there's a brand where you yes. can put in all sizes of DSLRs, which is a very good idea because if you're going to end up upgrading your camera, you don't need to change your housing as well. Yes, but the problem most of the time with that kind of housings are that they don't have the buttons. Uh -huh. That's yes. correct. So, they, so like, like this camera, uh, this housing is made especially for, for this Canon. So all the buttons that you have on the back is actually in the proper position and mm -hmm. then you can change everything um, under the water. Uh, with, uh, with that type of housings or uh, one fit all, you will have only the basics button. And then of course, inside you have to set them properly because if you do, right. don't do it properly, you're losing the buttons. And like even with um, um, to, to shoot the, uh, the picture, it's sometimes hard. I, even when, um, when you buy a cheaper housing, when the camera doesn't fit perfectly, it has a bit like one, two millimeters uh, loose inside all the um, all the buttons that you have on the back can completely stop working because we've got of course we've got we're going down we've got pressure that the um the housing is always working a bit yeah it's moving it's it's squeezing a bit so then we have problems that either it's pushing the buttons on its own because it's like too tight or the the buttons doesn't work completely so yeah, the housing is a very, very important thing because of course it costs a lot of money, but it, it's actually made to protect a lot of money. Um, it's a thing that you have to take care about and uh, you have to rethink it before you, before you buy it. Yeah? So you, you have to think in front that you, at some point you will go deeper or at some point you will need something more. So it's easier to spend more money at the beginning. And the bigger investment as well, besides the cameras, as uh, Arik is about to introduce the lights. Yes. Uh, you need to spend. That is where you're going to spend your big money because the lights are what help you. <laughs> Without the tools, you can't do much. Yes, and of course, uh, when you're shallow, when you're doing pictures shallow in a great visibility with like in Malta when there's um, a lot of sun, let's say during the summer, because today wasn't that perfect. <laughs> but if you've got a lot of light in the shallow waters, you don't actually need the light. But as a diver or a free diver, when you go deeper, you will always need the light to get the colors out, um, to get the proper shoot, to get the, um, uh, the right exposure time and things like that. And what are we mostly working is video lights. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like continuous, continuous light and we do use strobes. And for now, um, it's changing a bit because most of the photographers are starting to use the video light. That's because um, the video lights with all the new technology are getting way more power. And, um, and actually uh, you, can, you can use it for um, photography underwater. I'm using a video light. John is using video lights as well. Okay? So that is the video light that I'm using. It's actually a Polish brand, so it's not well known, but it's super powerful. There's a good reason to using video lights against uh, strobes, but as well. As you can see, mm -hmm. it is a huge thing. And um, of course, is it a video light or is it a strobe? It has all of the pluses and minuses. Um, it's the same, basically like above the water. So anybody of you who was, um, doing photography in a studio with the strobe lights, they, they know the basic problems of strobes, yeah? Um, um, so, of course, you've got a, the pilot light, yeah? Like, I've got a strobe to this old um, camera, this Nikon 80, that's a strobe, yeah? <laughs> it doesn't, um, doesn't look 
like something that you want to take underwater, but it's like huge, powerful straw. And I've got a smaller one that is a new one to my housing. Of course, it's like an entry level straw, but it does its job. It's not the strongest one. It has a pilot light in here. So the pilot light normally is like on to hope to help you focus and um, to see where the light is approximately going. And then when the strobe is flashing, this light is going off for a second and then coming back again. So it's like connected and it's pretty much like, um, like in, a, in a studio. The difference is underwater with, um, with doing photography underwater, we want to mix the ambient light that we have with the light that we are taking down there. Either is a video light or strobes, and especially with the strobes, um, we normally want to have this blue water that's behind and, and the divers and everything that's like in the further plan. So we have to mix um, the, amb the ambient light that we have with the strobes and everything. That means that um, if we will take a strobe with a second video light that we use only to, um, uh, to focus or something like that, and it's not switching off, it will be visible on the photo. Yeah, it's not like in a studio that you don't have to care that there's there's lights in the studio because you're like ISO 100, F16, yeah, and the strobe is is completely on full. Yeah, and then it will not go on like one two hundred of a second, so you will not see it. Underwater, it's mostly the times are a bit longer, so it's about one forty. 150, 160, that's, that's the max. And uh, most of the time, if you've got some additional light, it has to go off when you're shooting, especially with the strobes. Uh, that's why the video lights are a bit better because when you switch it on, you just switch it on, you, you can see what, where the light is actually going. You can, you can change it at that time and, um, and it's easier, of course. They are not that powerful. And the strobe has this, this additional stuff that it's actually freezing movement. Yeah? With video lights, when you have to go down with the shutter speed, it's not that obvious, but it does the job. And now the video lights are getting stronger and stronger. Of course, you have to pay a lot of money to get the good ones. Uh, but now a lot of people are changing to video light. And the, prob the normal problems, of course, with both will be like the, the color temperature, like mine strobes have different types of top that you can put that can actually change the temperature of the, of the flash that you have. So it's, it's basically the same like you will use in a studio on top. John, you've got something to add? Because I have to drink my coffee. I'm go for it, go for it. No, the, like Eric like was saying, there are advantages and disadvantages to the strobe. You know, I prefer the video light because you don't really miss any shots with the video light. With yeah, the strobe, that's true. Like the, 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 keep the, changing uh, the settings, keep changing the settings. If you have the right uh, video lights, you can afford to do, you, you don't need to waste time, you know? Yes. You can keep going and going, you know, on one, on one dive. Yeah, the problem with the strobes and the difference between underwater and above when you've got a model in a studio and something is going on that you have to check the the strobes or change something you can you can tell her to chill out or, or him and uh, the, the, you can afford the, the time fish will not wait yes mm -hmm. and if you've got a strobe that's not um, uh, not refreshing that fast uh, you will you you will lose some shots so so that's that's a big problem and with a uh, video light, you can also have backups because obviously sometimes a light might not work. So you at least have a backup. If you have a flash, you have one, it's gone, it's gone. Your dive is over. You know, you can't do anything with it, without it. Well, you can, but uh, the quality is not going to be there at all. Of you course, the, the flashes are like usually connected to the camera. So like there's two types of cables that you can use, the ones that are using... Uh, mm. Fiber optic. Fiber optic fiber optics yeah so basically you have to flash inside the housing that and the flash is going through 
so the photocell is catching and, and the strobe is flashing. And normally all of the uh, all of the strobes they have the photocell as well, and um, they can flash when they see other flashes in uh, under the water. So when you have a lot of uh, photographers at the same time in the water, it can be a huge problem that you're just shooting and everybody else's lights are shooting and you don't want it. So things like that are are something normal. Uh, the choice is always photographer's choice. So there are people who will say just strobes, nothing else. And there will be people who will say, okay, video light, because I don't have time to play. Correct. Let me... Okay, so the additional stuff, rig sports uh, and additional equipment. I am prep for you, uh, a few pictures in here because having a housing and having a strobe or a light, it's not everything. Uh, it has to be mounted somehow. You have to have this equipment all together. You have to be able to take it underwater and like carrying with you. So all of the uh, cameras are normally mounted on, on the rigs. So that kind of stuff that can, they, they can be like in a completely different um, uh, settings and you can actually set your own with three, four or even more to, to take more equipment. Um, and you don't want the lights or the strobes close to the camera, close to the lens. So normally what photographers are doing, like you can see at the, at the photos on the bottom, uh, they are taking the lights as far as possible from the, uh, from the lens. So you're using arms like that to extend them and to get them further and you can actually manipulate them in uh, a lot of different stuff. Um, when you're changing the lens, because of course nobody will do a macro shot with wide angle, uh, so then you have to take a different lens, and different lens means a different port in front of the of the housing. So like you can, that's wide angle dome port, and if you take in like a macro uh, a macro lens, you will have that type of a of a port that you just changing up front of your uh, of your housing and like even for GoPro cameras, it's super wide angle on its own, but you can have a dome port like that, that you put the, the GoPro inside to make it even wider. And of course, how big is the dome port up front? Um, bigger than better. Of course, when you, when you have a macro shot, it's completely pointless, but when you have a wide angle, you have to have a bigger port, a wider angle, you have to have a wider um, dome port because it will give you uh, black spots on the on the picture. Uh, as you can see in the pictures, like um, top right and in the middle, there are a lot of modifiers for lights and a lot of modifiers for the mm, for the housing. So the top right is a set for macro photography completely even with the uh, extension that will do that you can do a super macro so more than one to one and in the middle you can see that the uh, the video lights and the strobes can also have like snoots that and basically you can mount on them special stuff that will work exactly the same like the uh, the modifiers that you use on strobes uh, in the studio so there's plenty and plenty of different stuff that you can buy and the money is never ending. <laughs> so that was the equipment, just the basic stuff, of course. Uh, now let's talk about types of underwater photography. And I prep some types, but, um, okay, I will tell you. So the first thing is photogrammetry and science photography, macro rex models, black and white, split shots, wildlife, underwater fashion and commercial. And sometimes people will say like, why there is a black and white as a special stuff in it. Um, I wanted to include it in here because a lot of competitions in underwater photography um, are having black and white as a completely separate topic. So you put, anything that can be on a, on a photography, but it has to be in a black and white. And then they have like a separate um, contest for that. I don't know why it's like that, but, but a lot of, uh, of the big competitions have 
things like that. Now, photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is basically combining images to get more or less 3D or 2D images, and it's used uh, mostly in science photography. So archaeology and, and things like that are using um, now of underwater photography uh, to do mostly 3D images, but also to document the sites that they are doing. At the past times, the divers had to go, they had to go take the pencil and sketch everything that there was on the bottom in the right place. Of course, they put the grid on the bottom and then made what is there. Now they can do it with the cameras and then the in computer, they can put it uh, all together and have the full view. Check. Yes, exactly. Uh, now, uh, the best example for this is actually something that um, Heritage Malta is doing. So the virtual museum, you can go on the website that's uh, underwatermalta.org and you can see most of the wrecks, if not all of the interesting wrecks that you can see that you that you have in Malta in the 3D uh, version, because somebody went there, did thousands of overlapping photos, then they put it in the program that is preparing 3D uh, models, and we've got an example. That's again the submarine uh, that you've seen the photo previously uh, in the hole. I think usually they do this with a drone, right, Ayak? No, 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 no. No? I know, I know, and I've been, when they were doing like the Farood and all that kind of stuff, so it's basically a diver with a scooter that's going and going and okay, shooting okay. as much as possible. So basically what, how does it work is a diver is going on a certain depth, doing a loop, mm -hmm. shooting everything around, going a bit deeper or from depth to, to top, and like going up, 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 shooting as much as possible. And then everything lands in a, in a computer program that's doing that kind of 3D imagining. Of course, in a, when you go to the website, you can watch it from all sides. It's actually amazing, amazing stuff to have, especially like for me when I'm, um, I, when I'm an instructor and I have to tell people about the wrecks, this is perfect. They can look at from every, side and I can do a briefing how to do the dive without any problem. Second is macro and I think that's one of the most popular um, types of underwater photography. Uh, macro photography, underwater like macro photography above the water um, is trying to find something that is really small most of the time it's something that's living in there, like the nudie branches that you have on the left side or small fishes that you can see on the right side and try to do a good photography of it. The problem is, of course, to make, make it interesting and get the light properly. And uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of amazing macro photographers that are doing just that. Uh, this is John's photo of, uh, what is it? I forgot. Basically, it's a, uh, it's a jellyfish that, that is zoomed in. The jellyfish is the size of your thumb, that. And from what I understood, <laughs> that's a little fish inside, basically, yes. according to Alan J. Dune. And basically, that was during a night, uh, a night dive. At night, a lot, of, uh, a lot of strange things come out at night that you won't normally see during the day everyone's they're all hiding during the day so at night they feel more comfortable and once you shoot the light at them at an octopus or at a fish or whatever they just don't know what to do they just stay there like christian caruso just said uh, on the chat it's a box jellyfish exactly yes it's correct. Like, and what's more, uh, super interesting in the photo um, all the the blinky stuff that's go around uh, if that's not another jellyfish, it's, uh, it's something that is called scattering and it's a huge problem in underwater photography. So for us, the water looks transparent, but there's a lot of particles that are inside. And when you do, uh, when you put the lights on them or a flash or something, they will just like blow up. Like right. um, it's the same effect like when, you, when you're shooting in winter 
and the snow or the or the uh, rain is falling when you shoot the lights it will it will completely pop up so when you when you have your lights underwater not in a, not set in a proper way you will have tons of things like that on your photo and it's super heavy to get rid of it it takes that a lot of mean, time of yes but like to clean going it up one by one it's not an option sometimes there's there's millions of things like that so a lot of photos were ruined but by 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 this thing yeah mm -hmm. another photo flying gurnard these i use uh, for the macro i use uh, 24 to 70 and i have um i'll show you hold on It's a 24 to 70 lens, an Nikon. And basically to get closer to the subject, I just have a, I don't know what to call this, a filter, basically, a macro lens. It turns it into a macro lens so I can get as close as I want to the subject. If you can see, I mean, uh, like in this photo, the amount of detail you can get. It basically turns a 70 millimeter into about a 105 millimeter. And that's how I get so close to them. Then obviously yes. the light. Actually, when you go to this, the the nudie branches on the on the left side, they're they're just like that. Yeah, they're like maybe five millimeters. So very close. Yeah, it's really it's really amazing that you can see that kind of stuff and do. And what colors there. come out? Yeah, again, another nudie branch on the left, and uh, some cuttlefishes. And these cuttlefishes were made for sure on a 50 millimeter lens. The next thing is common known wildlife. So basically like a bigger animals that are going there. So bigger fishes, um, wider angles, a lot of, uh, you, you for sure you've seen a lot of pictures taken in some uh, coral reefs that there's a tiny fish and a huge corals and things like that. So that's what goes into the wildlife uh, category. Yes, dolphins are wildlife as well. And you can see that the that the on these pictures the water is completely not not that clear. Yeah, all that goes around this dolphin is a problematic stuff. It can be blurred, but it's not. Sometimes it's not even worth to to touch it. Models um, and models by models, I I mean more free divers and divers that are posing to the pictures. So you do a pictures of them underwater because the fashion photography when you dress up the model uh, is a completely separate and it's always always a separate uh, thing. So free divers or divers will be our models under the water. They can pose or they can just just swim and do the dive with us. Um, you can shot, shoot on the wrecks. Uh, having a, a lot of friends with free dive, with being a free diver is an amazing thing because you can always call them and take them for a for a dive and shoot that kind of pictures. Uh, next, pretty common thing is is uh, photography of wrecks, uh, especially in Malta when the diving is most of the time. A wreck diving, um, everybody is doing a wreck photography. So this is a very, very popular stuff. And as you can see, this wreck is like 40 meters long. That's stuck to us. Yeah, that's stuck to, huh? John? Sorry, because I was on mute. Yes, correct, that's stuck to. Yeah, so it's like 40 meters long. And with 20 meters and, Yeah, it's really hard to take the whole wreck. And as you can see at the end, you can't even like completely see. And that's the effect when you go too far from your main subject. There was a day of good visibility that I managed to get the whole yes. wreck, but that was once. <laughs> uh, actually, on TAC2, I don't remember good visibility. Oh, just once, and it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It literally, uh, the whole wreck I got on it. I should have given you that photo, but... Uh, but that's, uh, that's the best spot if you want to do macro photography uh -huh. and moody branches. That's the best spot. You will always find, find them on the top of the conning tower in here. So that's, uh, that's for sure a place to go for the macro photography. The wreck is not actually interesting, so... Uh -huh. 
Um, yeah, another example is from mine photos from the Vrex. The left one is the one that's in Gozo. Uh, the rose is the other one. Uh, the, the right side is Rosie, the, the one in Chirkewa, and uh, the left side is Gozo. Uh, Caruela. Caruela, yeah, exactly. Beautiful. The Caruela is, uh, the bottom is 44, I believe, and, and the right, the Rosie, is 34. So you can see right. how, how uh, not enough light is there on, on both of them. Common, uh, next common um, things about photography, and there's a lot of contests that are taken at separately, is split shots. And split shots is something that you, um, you have to have a wide angle and a dome port like this one. Both of these pictures were taken with the GoPro and with this dome port. Um, and of course, then you can do a half-half photography. So um, the top and the bottom, like in here, the, the right one was um, taken close to the entry to the harbor in Cherkowa, and the second one is uh, in Zurich after a dive on Um El Farouk. Um, of course, there can be more interesting stuff to photograph uh, like half-half, but the problem is that when you're doing that kind of photography with wide angle, you have to be really close to the thing that's um, on, um, on top because it will always look like really, really small. So you have to be really close to the, uh, most of the pictures is like a boat on the top and divers underneath doing, doing a dive. And you actually, if you would see how the diver did it, it's like he was super, super close to the boat to get it. And fashion, and fashion is a, a, a completely separate thing. Uh, in here, you can see the model that John did in Um El Farut, Frek. Right. It's yeah, very, yeah. This is how I do it is, um, sometimes I, the free diver is comfortable enough to go down without any aqua lungs, without any scuba, but uh, sometimes I find it better that they come with scuba and they pose uh, at the bottom of the wrecks. Like that we have more time, like that we can do more. And then one diver can do about, Four different, four or five different uh, spots on the same wreck. Uh, this is a wreck which is a uh, 110 meters or 105 meters, and it's, deep. and it's quite deep. So, ah, uh, what we do is we basically I pose her, I wait for her over there. She gives me 10 seconds. I take my shots. If I get my shots, all the way, all good. I just make a sign, give her the air, and. Uh, she holds on to my uh, tanks at the, on the back and we swim off to the next position and we keep going like that. So they're dangerous, but we always have uh, someone with us. So it's always careful at the same time. These are the most interesting ones because it's not normal to have um, someone inside the Um El Farud, you know, without any aqua lungs. If John is taking too long and not getting the right shot, she will not get the air. So she has to like pose properly from the beginning. <laughs> and that's why you use video lights and get the shot as quickly yeah. as possible. Not stay fiddling around with the... With the with yeah, the, like uh, imagine her waiting for you to take a shot right. and you will like try to change something with the strobes. It's just like amazing. <laughs> I mean, I've taken down a free dive uh, in Aura. There's a Jesus statue over there. This, uh, this man goes down to 75 meters without any aqualands, you know, it's very impressive. So when I told him to pose behind the Jesus statue, he was there just going up and down and up and up, just at, uh, at about 35, 40 meters it was. And he just took his time. These uh, free divers are very impressive. They can keep their breath for a very, very long time. They train very hard. They're good to work with. As you were saying, Eric. Of course, you can do the same in like super shallow waters and it doesn't actually have to be a, a professional free diver or something like that. And a lot of um, photographers that want to do either the split shots or underwater photography with models, they just go on the shallow water. They just have to have a model that is not afraid of the water and like can open their eyes in the water and like dressing up. 
Uh, there's plenty of photographers that are doing a fashion uh, photography in the swimming pools. It's a very common practice to do it, especially um, with swimming pools. It's really easy because um, what you can do is uh, you can put the strobes and lights above on the surface. And when you shoot, the photocell will catch it and shoot the, the strobes that you've got, like the... Uh, um, the strobes from the studio lights that, uh, that connected with the transmitter you mean uh, hmm? you mean connected the flash with the transmitter from the outside yes 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 so like the like that you don't studio lights the studio flash. lights are above on the edge of the water shooting down in the water so that you can do it at night and all that kind of stuff Correct. Um, when there's nobody on the swimming pool uh, so it's a pretty common thing we don't do that yet i think you did some kind of that? I, I, coincidentally, I have a job next week to do it. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, we're trying to get the background black. We're trying to do a lot of things. Let's hope it works out. <laughs> but it, it should be interesting. It's a new job. We'll see what happens. It should be and another thing, black and white photography. So basically, um, your photographs that are con converted to black and white. Uh, I don't know actually why uh, the contests are taken that completely separately. Uh, I was always thinking about the underwater photography that when somebody is doing that, it's just they can't get the white balance properly or it's too grainy or something like that. So they try to save it by making it into black and white. But um, then I, I checked and there's a lot of underwater photographers that are doing strictly and only black and white photos. Of course, you can do a commercial job um, underwater and um, commercial like photography for uh, to do underwater is very rarely not related to like diving or free diving industry. So most of the time it's diving equipment like in here, like the computers, watches for divers and, and things like that and catalog pictures of divers with, with beautiful uh, colorful equipment but it's a job that is like really way uh, well paid now can we unmute everybody please okay so now let's have a minute of a talk and then we go to the questions Yes. How are we doing the question? Nelson, Nelson had a, you are doing great, even with time. Okay. Nelson had a question. Uh, is Nelson uh, hearing us so that he can put a question himself? I, um, said, I think it was someone Diego that was asking a question about the type of lights. But you, are, I think you explained okay. that maybe if, yes. if, if you weren't that clear, maybe Diego will speak again. I am muted. I, 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 I see Nelson's question. Uh, it says, uh, do you plan with the free diver, the dive? You plan, uh, yes, everything is planned before we go in the water. We, uh, we, we uh, have a briefing. We say what we're going to be doing. Um, basically, the whole plan of the dive the whole plan of the normal dive and the whole plan of uh, what the photo shoot is going to be about. If I had to ask you um, the weight you are carrying every time. Well, the weight on the water doesn't make a difference, to be honest. The kind of weight I have, sometimes I take two cylinders. I have um, my, my camera gear and my lights. I mean, altogether, I wouldn't say my camera gear and lights wouldn't be more than eight kilos. I think that's a lot, actually. I think that's a lot. It's more like six kilos, something like that. But underwater, again, you're not going to feel the weight. Your only issue is keeping it neutrally buoyant. Because if it's too heavy, it ends up becoming a weight for you. And you don't want more weight. And you don't want something to float you up either. Because at the end of the day, the housing is a, a bubble. Yeah. You know? So There's a question from that. Christian Caruso. Um, my main problem with underwater photography is getting the focus right. Do you use manual focus, especially in macro shots? No, I don't use I don't use manual focus. 
manual focus, again, is something that you need time for. And when you're underwater, you don't have the time to stay getting, you know, you end up losing your shot because if you have, if you're taking macro of, uh, of a fish, you know, at some point he's going to move, you know, he's going to get fed up and move. So no, I don't use manual focus. It's always autofocus, always. I mean, if you have a good DSLR, you, you know, your focusing is going to be on spot practically every time. Yeah, you know, I use, um, not mirrorless, I'll show you that out. Single reflex, a mirror. Um, so the focusing is always spot on, you know, yeah. What's this for? The same for landscape. Um, in what sense for landscape? Christian, you can speak. Uh, you can open yeah. up the mic. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, because sometimes I'm like, I am there like taking a picture of a wreck and you can set a really high depth of field. Mm -hmm. But then there's the focus and it's kind of screwed up. So it's kind of... Because you focus. can't afford a lot of... You're right. I know you guys say. Um, you can't afford um, your, um, your aperture. You can't afford to keep it very close. At the end of the day, you're losing more and more light. And yeah. the more close it's going to be the aperture, the less speed you're going to have. And you want yeah. speed in the, in the shutter, you know? So... Uh, I try to leave it where it's not noticeable in, for me between F4 and F7. I don't go higher than F7 because you end up losing too much light. But F4 okay. seems to be, you know, the sweet spot that it's, it's not noticed. You're not seeing the depth of field if you don't want to, you know? Okay, okay. Yeah, I usually use uh, like between four and six, that one. Correct, that's, uh, for me, that's the idea. Then my speed, I put it um, around, it depends. Usually, yeah. not higher than one twenty-five, one two five, one two fiftieth of a second. Yeah. Always higher. Yeah, I have okay. shaky hands. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I was wondering, even in the split photography, like the one that uh, Alec did, um, how do you manage that focus? It's just automatic in that case as well. Say again. Repeat. Like in the split photography. <laughs> yes. Um, you focus on the, uh, for, for example, in my, in my way, when I do the split photography, um, we don't have a photo here, eh, Eric? Oh, wait, of... wait, no, there, there will be some. I was muted no all the time and I was talking all the time. Don't <laughs> worry, don't worry, don't worry. That's just, I mean, um, like, really nobody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> what I like to do when it's coming to underwater and when it's coming to split screen, uh, so to, to have the split levels, you focus on the bottom because that's what you want oh, clear. Okay, okay. Top, you can kind of make it out, you know, it's a bit rough there, but you're going to make it out with your eye. The bottom is what you need to have focus on usually. Okay. Uh, it's, I would say completely different. The uh -huh. thing is that you've got completely two different um, set of things that it will see water and air. So it will never be in the same focus. You will never have no. a focus that, let's say, if a model will be half out and half down, a part of it has to be not in the focus. Yeah, because okay, the focus okay. is set at or for air or for water. One part will always be out of focus. And uh, what you can do is basically like take the camera, point it outside or inside on the things that you want, mm -hmm. press the button half, do what you want to do to make yes. the perfect shot and just just finish the shot. Okay, and yeah. And you focus on the bottom. On mm -hmm. usually it's underwater you focus on. Then the top it's going to be it's going to be blurred anyway. So okay, okay. It depends see. what okay. you're shooting, you know. So it's like you are underwater. You press halfway and then you move midway. Yes. And, you... and get into the middle of the shot. I mean, okay. I use a dome like this. You, you need a big dome for it. You cannot use, just go with a GoPro and do it. The GoPro yeah, must yeah. have a dome. I mean, this is my dome of the DSLR, what I use for what I take underwater. I mm -hmm. mean, you just literally get it down to half, focus on this, on the bottom half, get it back up and take your shot. Okay, it's, okay. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Because remember, your, your, um, your camera settings for, the, <laughs> for underneath the water are going to be different with your camera settings on land with the sun and all that light, you know, yeah. so. Especially the exposure, yeah. Correct, yeah, but that's, a lot of post-processing, post obviously. For that's that. when, the, when the lights 
that you have underwater is is useful yeah because outside you will always have a, a way more light correct so when you have additional light always use it under the water okay okay thank you thank you both no problem thanks for asking any more questions are there questions the dome that you use is made from plastic or glass plastic the pyrex i think it is most to be honest, I'm not too sure, but um, no, not glass. You can get it in glass and yes. spend a lot of money. <laughs> this one is glass. That's glass. It's glass. You have to be very careful. That's the thing. Yeah. You're going to end up scratching and these things. And I mean, with this, um, what I like about it is, look, if you, you, you can't see it too clearly, but I mean, I've knocked it quite a few times. You can see quite a few scratches on it, but because it's wide angle, even with the macro, actually, it doesn't come out. The scratches don't come out showing on the photos. So you can afford to stay a bit longer with it until you replace just the, just the dome. The thing, it will, they will, the scratches will show up when you will be doing photography under the sun. That's then true, you will exactly. see the scratches and everything like that. Yes. So if you have a dome port that you scratched a lot, uh, you have to avoid that type of photography because it will, it will show. Just don't use it on land. Eh? <laughs> There's no reason to use it on land. <laughs> but uh, me, for me, the main thing is, uh, all right, the camera is, uh, is important, but the, the most important is the light. Without the light, like Shay, you know, you have nothing. You know, you can't just, you can do a lot of post editing, but you're not going to get the quality that you get with uh, proper lighting. John, when, when you're saying using the light, um, so when you're down there, mm -hmm. um, you plan who's going to hold the light, maybe, or you're going no, to no. just light. fix it, fix it to the. My lighting is like this. I have a. This is my housing. Okay. Like the camera goes in here, the lens comes in here. Okay. The lights, I put them on here, one and okay. two. Okay. And usually, I have a third one that comes all the, all the way up here, and like that, I'm in control. You know, th th this is all flexible. Like Arik was showing you those arms as well. Those are very flexible, so you can position where you need to position. Then if you want to get fancy and, and what do you call it and get other lights involved, then you can just place the lights on the floor, on the ground, push on the floor. There yeah, you but if you have an additional divers, they all can have lights and if they're all coming from the side, then it will be the most amazing shoot. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Especially if you have continuous lighting. Correct. Because you're in control and you know what's going on. You're not going to take a shot in the dark. and You don't have the time underwater. You don't have the time. And you don't want to miss your shot either. Eh? You know, in fact, I shoot in continuous. So if I get uh, 10 shots and then hopefully one of them is the right one. With the eyes open, eyes closed, or whatever. Are there questions? The uh, cameras that you showed us before, like the Nikon, mm -hmm. the yellow one, they are uh, ma uh, normal cameras, like uh, right. manual. Correct. No, like actually, like that's the. That's like this kind of point and shoot. The Sea Life actually has a manual mode, but the yellow Nikon doesn't have any manual mode. So and we, it actually doesn't shoot raw. Okay, just the, it's like the disposable ones that you used to use before. Uh, yeah, a bit more advanced, but basically the type. Yeah, but all the macro shots that you can see in here are made with that camera. So it's it's a pretty good camera. When you, like John said, when you add a good light to it, it, it you will have the good quality. Correct. So <laughs> if one is interested to start doing underwater photography, what are your tips from where he or she needs to begin? My tips, I think, will be different to Rx. So, so say yours, John. I will say my. For me, start diving, start diving, <laughs> start getting comfortable because, uh -huh, like Arik was saying, you can take photos without scuba diving. You can take photos as a swimmer, but with scuba diving, you have the time. You have the time. You can do more. You can get go further. 
you can you, you can see much more obviously eh? what you can see at uh, you know 50 60 meters you, you're not going to see at five meters or 10 meters so sometimes the background makes a difference for me but uh scuba diving even if it's not for photography it's an amazing thing i only started two and a half years ago and it's i, I can honestly say it changed my life and then on top of that you have the photography the photography part is a beautiful thing yeah i mean these aren't things that you're going to go to sala john gardens and see you know it's not it's not things you see every day what, what we see that's what's so beautiful about underwater that's my explanation so what i would say is I always claiming that to do underwater photography, you don't have to be a diver, but of course there's like, okay, let's say it different. If you want to do an under photography and be a diver, you have to be a really good diver. Yes, so to, to protect everything, not bump into, into corals and things like that and not destroy underwater and not kill yourself because there's additional, a lot of things that you have to take care of. Um, and for me, you don't have to be a, a diver. Yeah? Everybody that can go in the water, that can have a mask, and there's plenty of things that can be photographed when it comes to macro and things like that. And uh, especially uh, when we're talking in the photo society, I would assume that most of you um, have some kind of different ideas than the simple photos of, of a wreck or something like that. So if you have a vision that you want to do and it has to be done underwater you can do it in the shallow waters by just putting your hand underwater uh, so i wouldn't say that everybody has to be a, a diver in, in um, to start the underwater photography and of course to start you have to have some kind of camera uh, if you want if you're interested in in analog photography just buy the cheapest one that costs like 10 euros now with, with film inside ISO 800, that's what's inside and just go on shallow waters and try to do something. Yeah, Take a model, put her in the water, maybe not now because it's 15 degrees, but in the summer and, and just do what you want to do and check how does it look like after and, and maybe you will do more, maybe you will decide to be a diver and, and go deeper. And that will take you further. Yes, I agree. Step by step, everything. <laughs> Any more questions? Are any of you, have you, any of you ever dived? Or <coughs> Is there someone who ever dived? Stephen, maybe. Yeah. Stephen, yeah, hello. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Hi, yeah, Steve. Loud and clear. Yeah, I'm a diver. I've uh, been diving for three years. I'm actually an instructor now. Amazing. Um, have probably about 320 dives. Um, I started taking uh, video mainly from dive number eight. Um, it's not particularly good, <laughs> uh, but I used to like to log a lot of my dives. So, so I've got sort of quite a long dive history apart from when I'm teaching where you you can't use your camera because obviously you have to be focusing on on your students um, <laughs> but um, I, I haven't got a decent camera really for underwater and although I got a decent camera on land I can't really afford the housing for it because it would be so expensive but uh, yeah, something I'd like around. to do in the future definitely I mean anyway. you build it up slowly slowly yeah, you start with the housing then build the lighting yeah, or just go for GoPro. Or and you just can go take for it. Always have it with you. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I, I do. I have it. I have it all the time. The GoPro is uh, impressive. Uh, for the size of it, it's very impressive, especially yeah, like, the video. This is a photo wow. we made with a GoPro. And there you go. Plenty, plenty. This is a GoPro. Yeah. So I mainly got videos more than photos. Sometimes I just pull pictures off my video. You know. When I'm taking video, I try and if I think, oh, this will be a good picture, I try and be as, as, as you know, not move as much as I can. So I know that I could pull that out and keep it as a, as a picture, as a still. But remember that the quality will always be worse than the photo itself. 
when you do that. Agreed. 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 And especially with the new GoPro cameras, when you can shoot raw, uh, it's completely, completely different than when you're taking the, the shot from the movie out. Yeah, I understand. Cool. Anyway, I'm enjoying your talk. Thank you very much, Stephen. Janine, uh, do you have a question? Uh, I do, thank you, yes. Um, you were talking about the, the, free drive, the free divers earlier. Um, I was wondering what, you, you, you said you had to be very quick, but how long can they keep their breath for? Usually at a, at a, at a, at a pace of, uh, it depends, while you're on the dive, if, you, if she's coming scuba diving, she can't take longer than 25 to 30 seconds you've got. Because no, one minute day. you can join. Who's this? <laughs> Katya. See, oh, Katya. Katya. Katya is one of my. Uh, she, she, comes, <laughs> she was on, with me on one of Wait my shoes. Wait a second. What's it She you. taught me out. Uh, Katya was one of my buddies on one of, and, and actually this shoot of this photo that you're seeing in front of you, and uh, aha. Maybe it was one minute. <laughs> no, because I uh, posing sometimes as well, you know, and uh, one minute, it's uh, no problem. Correct, correct. Yes, so but I you do like, you do like John was doing with the model in here that you're breathing from the scuba and you're sitting in one spot. And yeah. when you, when the free diving you have to go down, it will not be that long. Correct, but when you're uh, when they're free divers coming from the surface, they can uh, they can take their time. Huh? Some of them can do very well, obviously, and some of them not so much. But uh, I mean, this one, this model, particular model, I mean, she goes all out. Whatever needs to be done, she gets it done. I mean, it's an important part uh, for something like this. You need someone. No, you cannot compare. Some divers can keep mm -hmm. five minutes. Some divers can keep uh, one minute. Uh, so uh, it uh, okay. depends on the free diver of how, how they are uh, professional, I think. But answering the question, you have to be fast. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so we've established it's not 30 seconds. It's one minute they take or longer. <laughs> Thank you, Katya. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, any more questions? Any more interesting questions or? <laughs> it looks like no. <laughs> it looks like no. Nobody wants to listen more. What about hosting, I want to say, uh, say um, uh, yes. for GoPro, they are not very expensive, not like uh, double price of the camera. So uh, this is the good uh, thing about GoPro. <laughs> So it's yeah, not the whole thing is way cheaper right? than the camera, so yes, yeah, that's, yes, that's yes. a good thing. That's a good thing with the GoPro, that's true. Um, Alex Kutaya is asking what ISO you mainly use. Again, this depends what camera you, you're using. I mean, the one I use, the D750, it can take it. You know, um, between 800 and 1000 is no issue at all. So depending on what lighting you have, you know, I mean, I can even go down to 400, which is nice, you know, more quality. But um, oh, I take it up to about 1,000, maybe 1,200, and that's it. But no more than that. And then yeah, the quality starts going. That's actually the thing why, why the underwater uh, photography is so popular right now, because the cameras are letting you to do more and more good pictures, even for people who doesn't um, have that much kind of knowledge. So the ISO, the new, um, the new sensors are really good and you can go with a the, with the good camera, you can go up to even like 2000 without any problem. And then um, um, when you do the correction in the, in the Photoshop, the, it will be completely not visible. And it's just like amazing how far the cameras went. So the okay. ISO and, and no dust and no, um, uh, no artifacts that are going in on the photo is just, just like super important for uh, for underwater photography. So if you if you have a if you want to choose a camera, let's say like that, if you for um, underwater photography between like DSLRs and or between the mirrorless, go and check the pictures. How do they look on high ISO? Because that will be something that is really important underwater. Correct. It's always going to help you that. Well done, guys. Well done. If anyone wants to know more about underwater photography and also land diving, I suggest that you 
contact Arcadius or John, they are on Facebook. Uh, so uh, they have their own website. So yes, there they are. <laughs> and Instagram to, to that's much more popular than um, uh, Facebook. So yes, uh, why not? You can contact them. I would like to thank them on behalf of the society for giving us this educational um, uh, photographic uh, uh, presentation. Um, I hope that uh, you, it was interesting for everybody as it was for me. I would like to invite you for today week with uh, Caroline. She's going to give us another informative talk on one of the first photographers in Malta, Leandro Preziosi. I would like to thank you and wish you a good evening.